Conversations with Uncle O.R. Tambo's Childhood Memoirs in Exile is a collection of over 30 letters to Dadu O.R. Tambo to, uh, by contributors rather, who were born, raised and educated in exile. The book pays tribute to the struggle stalwart who would have turned 100 in October 2017. I'm joined by the editor of the book, Ambassador Umamulindiwe Mabuza. A very good morning to you and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Dudu. I'm so excited to, ch to chat to you this morning and equally nervous. I must declare <laughs> that I'm in the presence of greatness. No, no, but, you're not. I, I, okay. In, in terms of the book, um, what brought this about? It's because um, in 19, oh, well, when O.R. Tambo turned 90, we did a book. Contributors from around the world called. Oliver Tambo remembered. It was edited by Paolo Jordan. But I did most of the work based in London in the mission of South Africa there. And so we thought that, and those were adults, I thought, you know, there were children that knew him so well as their uncle or dad or whatever name they had for him, who might have stories. And indeed, 30 have come out with stories, beautiful memoirs, their recollection of encounters with him, incredible details mm. of who this man was, how he was. To them? Yes, to them. He was the greatest human being. He was a giant in their little lives. But he didn't act like a giant. That's the, the beauty of O.R. Tambo, that we see him as an extraordinary figure. But he really was a very ordinary, humane human being. Mm. In the foreword, Umam Zanel Mbeki says something very interesting. She says, it's interesting to see how these children saw him in their eyes. And she learned something new about him. Is there anything new that you discovered from all of these letters about him that you had not known um, when you take a look at him through the eyes of the children? Yes, I didn't know how very fatherly he was. Of course, we all saw him as a father, but a real father. For example, uh, there is no Sizwe She's just finished high school, and he, her, father, her father has just passed on to Manogwe, the great first black advocate from South Africa. And he comes to her home, and he says to her, what can I bring you from London? I'm going to London. She says, jeans, jeans, Uncle Jeans. <laughs> He says, no, Caesar, you've just finished high school. You're no longer gene stage. Something elegant for you. Mm -hmm. And so he brings a, a suit, a costume, which she then uses at her graduation when she presents her thesis in the Soviet Union then. And she passed it on to another child of the ANC. There's another story uh, by Nora Apollos. Uh, her father was Namibian, her mother South African, so she grew up within Swapo. And they are in Tanzania. He goes to London, he comes back. He has a beautiful little red dress for her. And she wears this dress when she visits with her friends, the great African liberation icon, Mualimu Julius Nerere. She's wearing the dress that Oliver Tambo Cave. So these children have been in the, in, in the circles of eminent Africanists, Pan-Africanists. And so they've almost sucked it from their mothers and their fathers and their uncles' uh, DNA. Mm. It was quite a, interesting to see how the family unit operated um, in, in exile and to actually get the story of the children of exile because oftentimes we know the story of the men of exile but the story of the women and the children of exile is not often told. From your personal experience, how did he respond to the mothers of, of the struggle? He, he recognized the important role they were playing not only in the uh, obvious open space, but in the privacy of their homes. They were bringing up children, and they had to teach them. And they were the mothers who took into their homes and their hearts the, the young people who left South Africa after 1976, after the revolt of the students. And they had to be 
the ones who really made sure that the network was working for the kids. Um, many of them were professional people. In their own rights, they were ANC members. So they were teachers, they were nurses, they were doctors, but also they were carrying out the, the, the obligations of the struggle and connecting with women around the world. Um, for example, I know that uh, uh, the conference of United Nations conference in 1975 in Mexico, that ANC women were present there. The first international conference to, to look at the role and the status of women internationally. We were present in 1975 in Mexico, and it was followed by another one in 1980, the mid-decade, and I was at that conference with uh, the likes of uh, Ray Simons, who's late now, uh, Zanelle Mbegi was there, and many others, younger people. I think uh, Mrs. Squeer, Tutugi Squeer was there and then followed by the Nairobi conference in 1985, 10 years later. And there we had women from South Africa joining ANC Women in Exile mm -hmm. at that conference. So a lot of work was done by women. Would you say that history has sort of not featured women prominently on its Hall of Fame? If not, why is that? Because we, we're not doing it ourselves. I can't blame men for it all the time. But if we, we ourselves take the, the bull by the horn, we will we'll be exposed, we'll exposed. We need to write more about these women. There are women who are prominent, who are known, like the Ruth First. Uh, unfortunately, it's by negative things that they are both known because they were both assassinated here in Dulce September. Maybe those people, those are remembered. But there are great ANC women um, who have done a lot. Look at Barbara Masigela. She, she's a professor by a profession, but she was also a, work, a, a leader in the cultural work of the ANC. She ran the cultural department of the ANC for many years in exile. Mm. When we go back to the book Conversations with Uncle O.R., what are you hoping that um, whoever picks up the book will take away from it? I hope they'll say, this is the story that every South African should know. The story about this man in the humble opinion of the children. Uh, the story about the work that was done. For example, in the book, we have a whole lot of pages on Somafco, Solomon Matlango Freedom College in Tanzania. You know how that started? Well, in 1960, was 60, maybe 62, the Tanzanian government was desperate. The, the nurses who had been sent to Tanzania from Britain uh, as part of their exchange uh, for independence were to be withdrawn without replacement. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you take all those nurses out of the country, a new, a new country, newly independent country, and you don't replace them? So Oliver Tambo, one of his first missions abroad was to ask the ANC in South Africa when he was already outside to say, please, let's rescue the mission in, in, in Tanzania. Let's help the Tanzanians with nurses. 22 South African nurses left South Africa to go and work in Tanzania in replacement of the British nurses who had left. That was a great Pan-Africanist move, and it's a story that is not known in this country. We should be celebrating those 22 nurses right now. Right now, I only know the exist where the three of them are in existence. But we need to get back to, to the media and get the names of the people and try and trace them so that we know we've contributed to other countries' developments. And as a consequence of that, I think, uh, when we had all these children running away from South Africa, ANC said there's a need to build a school. It became imperative that we, we have a school. Instead of sending children to other countries, let's have them together in a school. So Tanzania gave us a farm. It was an old sisal farm, which was then developed into a school. We had contributions from around the world to build that school. I think the greatest contributions came from Scandinavia. Because I was there, mm. I know what the Scandinavians did. I know especially what the Swedes did mm. to make that school viable. 
They contributed buildings for the dormitories, for the kitchens, for the, uh, for the farm. We had a farm, viable farm, with uh, growing crops, vegetables, and poultry, and piggeries, and cows, milk, dairy, farm, dairy cows. We had um, furniture making because in order to have the desk and the, all the, the features for the classrooms and the bedrooms, you had to build your own. And after building, of course, the excess was sold, in, the surplus was sold in the local market. So there was a viable community developing in town. That's a story that is not told, that should be known. It's part of South Africa's history and South Africa's contribution. Because after that, that uh, when we became independent here, that facility, which was really an award-winning uh, development center, in, in the eyes of some Swedes, it had to be handed over to the government of Tanzania. It was a high school for us, but the Tanzanian government turned it into a university of agriculture. Sure. Your relationship or um, love for the continent, when you reflect on the days of old and today, I know it's a loaded question, but what would you say, or how far have we come as a continent in terms of creating this one Africa that the likes of Nkwame Nkrumah and, and um, others wanted to see. Where are we? We're not close to where we need to go. Uh, and I was listening to PLO Lumumba this morning and uh, brilliant Africanness. And he says part of it is because we've not gone out of the colonial mentality. We think we're independent maybe nominally independent, but we, we all are tied up to either Britain or France or Portugal, depending who the colonial master was, or Belgium. And until we get our minds clear on who we are, that colonialism was, should be out of our, of our lives, of our um, interaction. You know how many people were watching the royal wedding yesterday? Millions. Millions in South Africa. We have royalty in this country. How many of us have actually seen a royal wedding in South Africa? But this is so important. It's, it's absurd, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. I could talk to you the whole morning. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate and honor you. Thank you so much. Um, that was Ambassador Umamulindiwe Mabuza.